Hi. Hi. Today's a special day for you. Oh, Last God. night, you made your New York stage debut. I did. Thank you for coming in the morning after yes, to talk to us about it. My pleasure. What was it like performing Can You Forgive Her on the New York stage for the very first time? Um, it was really fun. I mean, it was, you know, exhilarating and um, terrifying and exhilarating again. <laughs> um, and there's one part of the play which I don't want to give anything away because you should all come and see it. It's of course. really, really great. Um, Currently playing at the Vineyard Theater. Yes. I, I, this will tell you how great I think this play is. I said yes to doing this play two weeks after I gave birth to a baby. The end. Um, I had a great time. It was really, it was really fun, and you know, I'm so lucky to be working with actors like Frank Wood, who's mm. I've been a fan of his for so long. So um, uh, we just we're, we're sort of finding it and, and having fun. She's such a brilliant character, Miranda, who yeah. you play. Yeah. To describe her in a couple of sentences for people who haven't seen the show last night, the only, <laughs> it's only performance so far. It was only one night. You guys didn't, <laughs> when weren't you there? No, it'll be running for several more weeks, but yes. to give people an idea of this character. Um, this, is, uh, this is a play sort of about um, the loss of dreams of people sort of trying to identify through their mother or their parent um, and how they can't really live up to their parents' expectations because they are failures sort of in their own right and trying to find out who they are away from their parents. And Miranda is, is kind of an awful person, which is so <laughs> fun to play as an actress. She's, she's slightly homophobic. She's slightly racist. She doesn't really know who she is or what she is other than she's, she feels like the system has taken uh, advantage of her and the world has taken advantage of her. And she's sort of in this strange relationship um, with a man and potentially another man. And she's just a mess. And I think that's always really fun to watch on stage. Um, she's also very vulnerable and confused and uh, naive about a lot of things in the world. So she's probably one of the more complex characters certainly I've ever played, but also that I've ever seen on stage. So, uh, and I see a lot of theater. I'm like you, I'm a total <laughs> theater geek. <laughs> yep, uh, proud of it too. Yes. Um, she's really complex in so many ways. And just the fact that she is uh, simultaneously like was one thesis away from a graduate degree and or a, a PhD in poetry. Yeah. Um, but she also has kind of chosen a life path that is generally associated with people who are um, maybe a little less educated. Yeah. Um, I kept kind of getting trying to rectify those two things and trying to and I feel like you're handling the intersection between them in a really brilliant way. Yeah, um, also, this play takes place on Halloween, so you're in a dress that's sort of a, a costume at the same time, yeah. um, which I think plays up that element of yeah. She's her one of role. she's one of those girls you'd see at a party or you know something where you're like, why are you dressed up in that kind of outfit at that age? I'm confused. <laughs> She's yeah. got a little bit, a little bit of that going on. Um, but it also underscores that role that she's chosen in life yeah. uh, in a vi visual way, which I think was really beautiful. Yeah. Um, you are familiar with the playwright. You have been for a long time. Yeah. How much did that play into your decision to say yes? Um, I, I've been, the playwright is a woman named Gina Gianfrido. She's incredible. She did this play a couple years ago called Becky Shaw that I saw also at the Vineyard that kind of blew my mind. And um, she also did another play called Rapture, Blister, Burn, which was amazing. She was nominated for two Pulitzers for both of those plays, I believe. She's, she's incredible with language and with her ability to create very singular characters and bring them together in this world that feels emotionally complex and extremely heightened. There's not a moment in the play where you're just sort of sitting wondering what the next move is gonna be. And that's always really fun. So um, I've been a fan of her work for a very long time. And so when, when I saw that, uh, when it just sort of come through my email, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. You're based in New York now, right? Yeah. You go back and forth between here and LA. Yeah, I've lived here for roughly 10 years though. Did the fact that this character had a poetry background play into your interest <laughs> I, in... I actually haven't asked Peter Dubois, who's our director, I haven't um, asked him how he came to choose me for this role. And I was when I read it, I was like, well, this woman's a drunk and she reads poetry. So I'm 
Are you typecasting? <laughs> what's, what's happening? Um, but no, I was wondering. I, uh, but then when I was talking about my poetry during rehearsals, they were like, had no idea what I was talking oh, about. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I imagine that that can contribute to kind of the backstory. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's certainly part of it. And although I never, I was a child actress, so I never went to college. Um, and there's a lot of language in the play about her experience spending a lot of money going to a fancy college. Um, so I had to ask a lot of questions about what, what, what the difference is between a state university and because I didn't know. Um, the, like you said, the idea of motherhood plays into this a lot. Has your reading of the play or your acting of the play been affected by the fact that you're a mother now? Does it like terrify you, this idea of motherhood sort of screwing the characters up and now I mean, you've got your own little one? I mean, it's certainly interesting because, you know, there, there's, a real, there's a real Jungian quality to the play that, t that you know, really does touch on our relationships with our parents mm -hmm. and their expectations for us and our own expectations for ourselves based on what they expect of us. And, um... You know, I think everybody has a complicated relationship experience with their own parent. And it's at a certain point, you have to kind of like find out who you are and press against that and press away from that. And uh, and this play has so much to do with that. Two people who were sort of like stuck trying to recreate their mother's dreams or, you know, living out their sadnesses or the things that they failed at and being stuck on their parents' failures. So um, it's, it's interesting. I've, I'm certainly... Uh, I don't directly connect it with my daughter, but um, but I think it's interesting to see now and to think about my own relationship with my mom. I, I would say the only direct connection would just be the fact that I have to um, pump my boobs backstage. Mm -hmm. I saw on your Instagram That's there's a, a great direct... picture of a room that was set up for you, yeah, uh, yeah, specifically for that purpose. There is. I have. We. It's that was one of the things like the the deciding that factor when they wanted an answer about the play. They're like, we're gonna set up a tit room for her. Mm -hmm. in the back. That's what the sign says and on the, the door. The sign says tit room, and my stage manager and all the wonderful people that work at the theater have created a little safe space for me where I can pump, but then also like my bottle cleaning brush is in the bathroom with like a thousand post-its around it that are like, Amber's bottle brush, don't use for mugs, don't touch, stay the fuck away. Am I allowed to cuss? I don't know. Yes, you are. You're I'm encouraged cussing. to. It's happening. Uh, well, so that... I'm trying to think how to phrase this question. Your, your costume leaves um, little to be to the imagination. Yes. Does that affect your pumping schedule? <laughs> like, are you going to fall out of it if you don't pump before These you go on stage? These are real questions. They are. I know. Um, I yes, I have a very strict pumping schedule so that I pump right before I go on stage so that there's not any situations, wardrobe malfunctions, as we would call it. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, it's also just kind of great to be, you know, for me to be a new mom with, you know, I had a C-section. I have no shame. I'm proud to talk about it. And I'm proud to have my little baby belly. This is You look child... amazing for having just had a kid. I'm I don't think I'm you have anything I'm to... sucking it in. <laughs> um, but I do love that she's in a dress that leaves little to the imagination. Yeah. But then also, like, I don't look like, I'm not a, I've never been a stick thin girl. Like, that's not who I am. And so I like that Miranda has some, you know, badonk. She's got some, <laughs> some badonk, as it, as it were. Because yeah. I think that's how those chicks look, you know? And I, I certainly, I feel, I feel fucking hot in that dress. You I look it. I don't actually care how I look. I, I care how I feel. Yeah. And that's what matters. How long have you been rehearsing this project? We've been rehearsing for, um... Oh, what has it been now? God, six, four weeks? I don't know who I am. I don't yeah. know. It's I think four it's, weeks I, it was, I mean. Four weeks, yeah. yeah. And was that right before you had your child? No, no, that was when the kid my, was a month my, old. My baby's two and a half months old. Yeah. So that'll give you sort of. Room. Are you getting any sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what's the last word that you said? <laughs> um, yes, no, she's she's getting some some good hours and my husband is home and not working right now. So that's been we, we sort of, he was working before I started rehearsal, and now we've switched. And now he's not working, and I'm working, so he's watching her. Whose idea was it to put the funny name on the baby announcement? <laughs> Can, do you remember what the name is? I can't remember it, but. I, I well, um, both of ours. Uh, I had always, well, as soon as we got pregnant, I was like, we got to do a fake celebrity baby name. Because my, our publicist <laughs> was saying, 
you know, what do you want us to say? Because people are going to ask, you know, once it's sort of out there. If you ha- like, we can either say no comment, whatever you want. I was like, no way, let's capitalize. <laughs> and I always thought about that Fiona Apple album that's like a, po- a really long poem. Oh, yeah. You know, that they would have to abbreviate. I was like, let's do the longest celebrity baby name that's the most ridiculous. So I think David came up with half of it. It was like, you know, uh, Sh- Shahrazad, Brittany... Uh, kumquat I don't even know I remember like that it had so RBG many, in it RBG <laughs> and also had the term mustard witch in it which <laughs> is that a thing I don't know I think I was high on Percocet like two days after my c-section I was like that sounds great <laughs> um but then we just it was it's a very 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 long name hence why um, I can't remember it. it made me laugh that people like refer to her as mustard witch <laughs> <laughs> she's just, gonna hate you look you've just, you've just great. but even into better this. even better that our publicist was getting calls from like you know entertainment tonight and all of these people like trying to confirm us weekly was like um, is this the name okay <laughs> just checking and we were like yes that's the name don't do not mock our baby. Well, I know that you you have a history of sort of challenging people to like with I remember the whole rap thing where you got the oh email saying, "Hey, <laughs> want to co- collaborate on my album with me?" Which who was it that did that? It was so my middle name is Rose, so my name is Amber Rose and the long story short of it is just that uh um I always feel bad about this because it really upset him. But um, then also I don't feel bad. It's hard to say. Tyrese Gibson pulled my email address out of an email we were all CC'd on and thought I was Amber Rose and (laughs) was talking to me about producing my next album. And I was like, that's rude. Um, You don't just, like, pluck someone's email. I I don't know. It seemed strange to me, so I I had a fun time fucking with him for about a week. (laughs) And you and released I, some actual rap I tracks. I made some fake raps, and I recorded them on my phone as demos. <laughs> and I sent them to him, but they were all... Fe- I described them as feminist raps, so it was all about, like... Like, there was one called Contraception Matters, and, and he just was more and more confused. And actually, the real Amber Rose and I are friends, and she found this hilarious. I wish I someday could talk to him about it, and I hope he finds some humor in it. I don't think he did at the time because it didn't make him look great. I put them on Facebook not knowing they were going to become public, and somebody copy and paste. Oh them, no! Like a private pa- Facebook yeah. account no one knows about. So, anyway, uh, well, that just seems like the same sort of humor, and I personally love it, and I love that about you. Good. Um, to switch gears a little bit, you're also directed, you've directed your first film. Yes. I got to see uh, an advanced you. Uh, screening of it. It's called Paint It Black, and you guys, I, I am known for going to the theater basically every day of my <laughs> life. I don't go to the movies a lot, but I, this movie makes me want to start going to the movies a lot, wow. because if, if film can be this gorgeous, I need to get more involved with it as an art form. I really was wow. blown away. Thank you. And we have a trailer, and I'm excited yes. to watch it together. Yes. Awesome. Good morning. My name's Detective Brooks. Has there been any individual you know that's been missing recently? We've got a white male registered as uh, Oscar Wilde. Mr. L. Has any living relatives? A mother. If my son had never met you, would he have killed himself? Huh? Not surprised she hates you. So you don't know how things used to be with her and Michael. It was just the two of them in their own little world. No intruders welcome. What do you want from me? I want you to suffer the way I'm suffering now. Listen, Meredith, I told people. So if I disappear, they'll know. 
imagination is running away with you, Charles. You're going to have to do better than that, Marion! You're going to have to kill me! Girl. Wow. I... I've described this movie as if David Lynch directed Grey Gardens. Um, but it's an adaptation of a Janet Fitch novel. Janet Fitch wrote White Oleander, and her novel after that was called Painted Black. And I read it about 10 years ago and was blown away by it. And it's, it's about two women who are sort of grieving over the death of this young man. One is the mother, who's this really wealthy, world-famous concert pianist. And the other one is a young punk rock artist girl, played by Alia Shawcott. And Janet McTeer plays the mother. And they sort of become obsessed with each other in this very twisted relationship that reflects equal parts blind trust and need. So it's a really, really great sort of psychological thriller that's slightly, slightly arch and heightened, like Sunset Boulevard or, you know. Sunset Boulevard was the, the first hunger, thing yeah. that I thought of. And I think it doesn't hurt that it, like, starts with a scene of a mansion and a pool. Yes. Um, <laughs> but that felt like a brilliant homage and sort of setting the, the yeah. tone. I was, I kept coming back to the word poetry. And, of course, I know that you're a poet. Yeah. Um, I felt like there was so much poetry in the direction, the way you use color and light and perspective, and also silence. Um, I felt like the music was so brilliantly placed and edited together. So you'll appreciate this. Um, actually, uh, Mac McCoffin, who's the lead singer of Super Chunk, he runs Merge Records, amazing. He did the soundtrack of this film. Um, and, it, and I really wanted that kind of sounds like I love the songs of things that influenced me and the tonal palettes of movies like Dar The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth and Legend, like that era of film. But it was actually the person who gave me the best advice about the music was Neil LeBute. Mm. He came in and saw uh, like one of the first cuts. He came to the, the editing suite and he was the one that's like, the acting is so good in this. I would cut most, I would take all the music out and see what it sounds like without, and then layer, start layering the music back in. So I give him a lot of credit for giving me that, that really great piece of advice. Yeah, that is great advice. He, you acted in Reasons to be Pretty in LA, right? His play? I did, yeah, and I did a, um, the recent reading at MCC for him here for the final installment of right. that too. Yeah. yeah. Um, this was not an easy project for you to get off the ground. I know it started with not even getting permission from the author of the novel right away, and that was just your first exercise in not taking no for an answer. I love an uphill climb, especially <laughs> when it ends with a beautiful result. Yeah. Uh, how victorious do you feel now that it's about to be released to the public? Uh, you know, it's, it's really kind of extraordinary. It's been almost 10 years in the making, and I do think this is an exercise in not accepting the word no, which is something that people hear a lot, but women really hear it a lot, mm -hmm. especially in my business. Um, for all of you that don't know this, though I'm sure you can, you can imagine it to be true, less than 5% of women in Hollywood of active directors, oh, sorry, less than 5% of active directors are women, and then only 1% of those are women of color. So everyone else are dudes. So it's, it's much harder, I think, for women to get a film made in the business. And there's, that's like a whole other program we can talk about. Yep, come back and we'll just is. talk about that. But, you know, it's, it, it was an uphill battle and it feels so great now. It's going to be out in theaters um, May 19th. It'll be here at uh, Angelica East and it'll be in Los Angeles. So we're going to have a big premiere. I'm really I'm very excited about it. Um, I'm sure I'm going to go see it in the theater. Yes. Uh, even though I've seen it already, just to see it on that big screen with the sound system. Yeah, it's a, and it's a, it's a ballsy film, for sure. I'm very is. proud of it. I'm, I feel proud for you, even <laughs> though we've just met. I just think it's such a tour de force. Awesome. Um, we have time for some questions from the audience. Okay, great. Hi, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? Good. Um, I love your work. I love, like, the projects that you choose to work on. Um, I think you're a very grounded actress. Um, Thank you. I love watching you. Um, and I love this playwright. She's amazing. Um, I was wondering, what were your influences um, as an actor and as a filmmaker? What are my influences as an actor and a filmmaker? Well, you know, I mentioned um, uh, David Lynch. I think I, there's a lot of filmmakers that I love, like Jane Campion, Quentin Tarantino, people like that, um, that have influenced me as a director that have a very specific stylistic look. I think tonally, 
um, for me, I always wanted something that had, uh, you know, that felt like slightly in a fantastical world and things like that. As an as an actress, you know, it's a hard qu hard question to answer because I've been doing it for so long. I'm going to be 33 this this month, and I've been acting since I was 11 years old. So it's hard to know what has influenced me. Um, I would definitely say this particular play and this particular role, uh, the character of Blanche Dubois is probably the, the closest thing, and Streetcar Named Desire, that this play, it will feel a lot like that. That's the hope, is that this character feels as sort of melodramatic and um, slightly delusional as that character does. So I would say that that's, that's the influence. Great. Hello. Hi. I have two questions. Okay. Um, in terms of the play, what, is, what did you find as the difficulties to doing a play versus film or television? Ugh, the difficulties of doing a play versus television. Well, I mean, t you know, acting in television or film is um, a much slower uh, experience um, in the sense that you do setups. So you set up a camera and you shoot one side and, you know, there's not there's not so much of a of a sense that you are working in the moment that it's real that it's everything's happening real time. Uh, it, it feels much more fake in that way. Then you go back to your trailer and you sit around for an hour while they light, and then you you know turn around and you face the person you were just talking to. Whereas in theater, theater reminds me actually a lot of I did, was on a soap opera for seven years when I was a kid. I was on General Hospital from eleven to seventeen. And it feels a lot like that, or like a multi-camera thing. I also did Two and a Half Men. It feels like that. Because you're, you're really talking to somebody else, and you're not pausing. You're not waiting in between. And for me, that's so much more fun. Uh, and that's one of the great things of being, you know, uh, I've, I've been very voyeuristic about theater since I was a kid. I see everything. And my agents for years have said, do you want to do a play? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Mostly just out of respect because I love it so much and I feel like they're such phenomenal, the best actors that we have in television and film in, across the spectrum is in theater, period, in my opinion. <laughs> so I didn't want to like touch that. Um, but then I, you know, in the last couple of years, I was like, I should just, it's te it terrifies me, so I should do it. Much like directing terrified me. And I've been in this phase, having a kid terrified me, the thought of, you know, Having a baby was like the scariest thing possible. So in the vein, I think, of expanding who I am as a person and as an artist, I really was like, I'm going to do something that thrills me and terrifies me, and that was doing a play. We have time for one more. Oh, he, had then, a, he had a double. Oh. And then the second question was, having directed your first film and going through that process, what did you learn about yourself as a director? What, say the last part. What did you learn about yourself as a director? Um... I learned that the, the, the process of editing a film is really very much like editing a poem, you know? And, and a lot of what you find that's most magical in the filmmaking process happens in the editing process. And things that you might normally want to convey through language or very straightforward can be found much more um, experimentally and poetically in the editing process. You can cut things out, you can imply things, you can imply emotion through visual texture without having to actually tell the audience what to feel. You can just let them feel it. That was, a, that was a pretty incredible experience. I really loved editing. That was my favorite part of filmmaking. I think we can still squeeze that last okay. one in. <laughs> Hi, thank you for waiting. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that statistic before about um, only 5% of directors being women, and that's kind of a discouraging number for you know, someone who's trying to get into the business. I guess what kind of, um, what kind of steps did you take to maybe reach that directorial role or what kind of um, uh, advice would you have for young women trying to do the same? It's, it's very hard, but you have to keep doing it. I know that sounds ridiculous, but when I talk about don't take no for an answer, you have to really do that. You have to first and foremost believe in yourself and believe in your work and what it is you want to do. And you might have everybody under the sun telling you that it's not good, it needs this, it needs that, this isn't commercial enough, or this is too commercial, there's a thousand reasons why. But you have to really believe in what you're trying to say. And if you have something to say, someone will find it. Someone will be your champion. Someone will get behind you and support that vision. So. Um, 
you know, it's discouraging, but also that's kind of what lights a fire under, a fire under my ass is just knowing like how little representation we have in art women as voices, even as playwrights. Gina, you know, most playwrights are men. So it's, it's really an important thing to keep pushing and not be discouraged, but let that, you know, not snuff it out, but more put a fire under, I think. Very well said. I'm so excited about all the work you're doing across so many different media right now. Um, I'm excited that we can go to the movies and see <laughs> Paint It Black. Yes, and he's open on the same weekend, by the way. Yeah, the so same make it a weekend. double header. Yeah. Go see the go see. Can you forgive her at the Vineyard Theater? Yeah, and then go and see. Hashtag see Amber the film. Tamblin weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Amber.